I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. Genesis 2, verse 17. It says, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. You know, it was not the will of God that man should have a knowledge of evil. In mercy, God withheld the knowledge of evil. God had a knowledge of evil, right? He'd been putting up with it in heaven for a little while, right? And uh, God knows everything. He's omniscient. He knows what evil is all about. But instead, he, God offered the knowledge of good. The knowledge of good. God is all-knowing. And he knew that would be the best for us. Fresh from the tree of life. That's where they, where they were to get it from. Yet Satan convinced man that God was withholding something good. And that the knowledge of evil would, would uh, result in man's becoming like God. You know, there's some things that God knows that he doesn't want us to know. God only wants the best for us. What he doesn't want us to know is about evil. So they ate of the forbidden fruit. And the knowledge of sin brought a sense of guilt. Soon they learned that help was available. A savior was available. As soon as there was sin, there was a savior. Whatever the sin, the soul who repents and believes, the guilt is washed away. Let's look at it. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 to 12. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 to 12. New covenant. New covenant here, Steve. Interesting. It says, for this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the, with, that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousnesses and their sins and iniquities. Will I remember no more? Covenant promise is found in, in the very, that the covenant promise, the beginnings of that covenant promise were found right there in that chapter where it talks about the fall. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. So it was distrust of God's goodness disbelief of his word and rejection of his authority that made our first parents transgressors. You know, some things never change. It wasn't too long after that, a few hundred years after that, that the Tower of Babel was built. Disbelief in God's word, right? Cause an awful stain. And today, oh my, we could talk about that too, couldn't we? We're living in probably the, the, the most hurtful age that, that there has been, if you think about around the world and what's going on everywhere. So Adam and Eve were brought into the world of a knowledge into the world with a knowledge of sin. It's not a knowledge about evil, but they had experienced evil through their own rebellion and their own rebellion against God. They had an experience of evil. A knowledge of evil is an experience in evil that brought weakness. It brought a distrust of God that somehow it cannot be erased without divine intervention and atonement. The result of this initial sin of Adam and Eve is manifest in every man's experience. Romans chapter 5, verses 17 to 19. Romans chapter 5, verses 17 to 19. It says, for by, if by one man's offense death reigned by one, 
much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, in the original that reads, the many were made sinners. That's everybody, right? So by, the, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. It's a part of every man's experience. Let's drop over to the right, just one, one page, to Romans chapter 8, verse 7. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And if we go back to Jeremiah, these are all familiar texts to us, but they're ones we need to review once in a while so that we can kind of understand what's going on around us. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 1 and 9. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. It is graven upon the table of their heart. And upon, the horn, uh, and upon the horns of your altars. And verse 17, or I'm sorry, verse 9. The heart is, what is the word here? Deceitful, deceitful above all things. And then it says, desperately wicked, who can know it? People don't even know what's in the heart, right? The carnal mind is enmity, hatred against God. Can you believe that? And, uh, because of the sin of our first parents, man bears the knowledge of evil all the days of his life. He will eat of it and experience it. Man does not regain the state of perfection instantaneously in the normal conversion process. We've all experienced that, I'm sure. The struggle for conquest of self, for holiness, and heaven is a lifelong experience. The ground that we walk on is cursed for our sake, Jesus said, God said. Genesis 3, cursed for our sakes. When we lost the state of holiness, a perfect garden could no longer teach the lessons that are needed to grow in character, to develop in character. Indeed, the ground was cursed for our sakes. Ground is symbolic of our hearts. Jesus told the parable of the, fo of the sower. And some seed fell on good ground, some on thorny ground, some, some fell on hard ground. <laughs> ground represents what? Our hearts. That's where the seed is germinated. Ground is symbolic of our hearts. Jesus' parable of the sower, seed falls on the soil of our hearts. Some are born here and some are born there. All of us are different as we come into this world. But... The, the good news is that help is on the way. Jesus is in the most holy place. Final atonement here. Blotting out of sins. I'd like to have you turn with me to Acts chapter 3. This is the good news of it all. Acts chapter 3 verses 19 to 21. Acts chapter 3 verses 19 to 21. Words of Peter here. Here's what it says. Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be, what does it say next? Blotted out. Blotted out. This is more than just forgiveness now we're talking about. This is an end time text, as we'll see here. That your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus, which, were, which before was preached to you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. I believe we're living in the time for the restitution of all things, right? It says that your sins will be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's the latter rain. That's the final outpouring of God's spirit. And then he will send what? Jesus. <laughs> then he'll send Jesus. Jesus is coming. But there is a needful preparation before he comes. Here we talk about the blotting out of sin, refreshing from the presence of the Lord, and then Jesus comes. 
This is a finishing work. The Bible talks about this in Revelation 10, verses 7 and 8. Let's take a look at that. Revelation 10, verses 7 and 8. Revelation 10, verses 7 and 8. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that is the seventh trumpet, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. That little book, the chapter starts out with a little book open. The little book of Daniel open now. It was a sealed book for, six, for many, many years. And uh, now it's open. And the mystery of God should be finished. We could look at another text, Revelation 7, verses 1 to 3. Revelation chapter 7, back to the left, just a few pages. It says, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and to the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And uh, the developing of the first fruits for the harvest. There's a harvest coming. This isn't always going to be this way. Revelation chapter 14. Let's look at verses uh, 4 and 14 and 15. Revelation 14 verse 4. These are they which are not defiled among, with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. These were redeemed from a man being what? The first fruits, the first fruits to the God, to God and to the Lamb. First fruits. That's an that's an Old Testament idea. It comes from the sanctuary service, right? When the first fruits were presented, this is the first community of saints who were are ready for Jesus to come. That's an amazing thing. These all answer to Daniel's great prophecy in the little book that was opened in the angel's hand under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be what? Cleansed or restored to its rightful state. Let's look at Leviticus 16.30. What happened on that day anciently? Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30. Leviticus 16 and verse 30. For on that day, talking about what day? Day of atonement, right? The judgment hour day. The day that was talked about in that little book of Daniel that was opened in the angel's hand at the end of time. The book of Daniel. For on that day shall a priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from what? All of your sins before the Lord. There needs to be a preparation for Jesus to come. Uh, what happens when, when God appears and nobody's ready for him? Everybody dies, right? They can't stand the brightness. The Bible says, then shall that wicked be revealed who will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So something has to happen before Jesus comes so that people will be ready and be able to stand in his presence. It's called... The judgment of the living. Let's read about the judgment of the living. This is used in the spirit of prophecy in this way, this text. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3. Verses 1 to 3. Some of you found this before I did. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. In my Bible, Malachi is just a very short book. How about your Bibles? It says, uh, <clears throat> starting with verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall pre prepare the way before me. 
and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may, be, who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as of gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in what? Righteousness. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 to 5. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 to 5. This is what we look forward to. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 to 5. It says, In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion, he that remains in Jerusalem shall be called what? Holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Let's look at another one. Joel chapter 2. Joel is that little book right close to Daniel. If you've been studying Daniel recently, it'll open right up to Daniel. Daniel, Hosea, Joel. Joel chapter 2. This is the Day of Atonement chapter. I've read that this chapter was read on the Day of Atonement to, to the whole congregation gathered around the temple. Joel 2, verses 15. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride out of her closet. And verse 25, and I will restore to you that the, the years that the locust has eaten. Anybody here would like to have the years restored that the locust has eaten? He's been eating on our lives, all our lives, hasn't he? On the day of atonement, He's going to restore the years that the, that, the, that the locust has eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and the great army which I set among you. This is roughly in the time of the great test when the image of the beast will be urged upon us. There will be something happening. Pretty important things. And you can read all about this. I'll tell you where you can read it. Some of you, we don't have time to read them this morning, but if those, some of you are taking notes, Second, second Selected Messages, page 81. Sixth Testimony, 130. Fifth Testimony, 464. And this last one uh, in the Fifth Testimony is a commentary on Zechariah 3. So let's turn to Zechariah 3. Something happens in this period of time. Zechariah is right close to Malachi. Zechariah 3. Actually, this is uh, the time of the judgment of the living, exact in, 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 in just like it was with Malachi 3. Now Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 5. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and the Satan standing at by his right hand to resist him. Now Joshua was the high priest during the time of the restoration uh, from Babylon. And Joshua was there, and who does he represent? All the people, right? As he goes in before God, who does he represent? Us, all of us, right? <laughs> if we lived in that day, it would be the people around Jerusalem. But in the real time, Jesus is our high priest. And as he goes in before God in the Day of Atonement, he represents all of us. So it says, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. Joshua was clothed with what? How many here are clothed with filthy garments? <laughs> Indeed we are, right? Are we still sinners? Yes, we are. And verse 4, And he answered and spoke to those that stood before him, saying, Take away the what? Filthy garments from him. And he said to him, Behold, I have caused your what? 
iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of garment. And I said, let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So he set a fair mitre upon his head. This is, talks about victory. You know, in Revelation, a number of times it says, to him that overcometh. There's a time coming when there'll be overcoming, right? <laughs> I mean, we're preparing for that day right now. Clothed with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Inspiration reveals that the last community of saints will, reg will, re will regain a state of spiritual holiness which Adam had, which Adam lost when he became a transgressor. How else could they be alive and see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven? What an idea. In their mortal state, the redeemed, they will live without a mediator in the sanctuary during the great time of trouble, right? The sin problem has already been solved in God's mind and in the sanctuary above. But what about the people on earth? This means that before Jesus comes, their characters will become pure and holy. By the way, what all do we take to heaven with us? Do you have anything you want to take to heaven with you? <laughs> Our characters. There's a definition of character in the spirit of prophecy. It says that the character is the combination of thoughts and feelings. We're not talking about absolute perfection here. We're talking about the perfecting of character, right? Thoughts and feelings. If the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. Is that right? When I think about something and, and think about it long enough, my feelings will follow that, those thoughts, right? And then sometimes those translate to actions. They might be good actions or might be bad actions, right? This means that before Jesus comes, their characters will become pure and holy. They are settled into the truth so they can't be moved from it, even when, when they're put under great pressure. When Jesus comes, it will not be deal with sin anymore. Let's look at it. It's in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. When he comes in the clouds of heaven, it's not to deal with sin. That's already been taken care of in the sanctuary. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. It's after Thessalonians. Hebrews chapter 9, 27. For, is it, for as it is appointed to men once to die, but after this the what? The judgment. We're living in the hour of God judgment, right? We're looking forward to the judgment of the living when things will be as they were described in Malachi 3 and Zechariah chapter 3. Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and to them that look, him, look for him shall he appear the second time. What does the next word say? Without. without sin. When he comes in the clouds of heaven, it's not to deal with sin. He comes without sin unto salvation. Before Jesus comes, a special work of grace called the final atonement. You can read about this in Great Controversy 464 and onward. A special work of grace called the final atonement. It's also called the blotting out of sins. And they're plunged into a time of trouble, worse that in, than any time of trouble since there was a nation, according to Daniel 12.1. And what do you think that that terrible time of trouble is going to do to these people and do with these people? The earthiness and the, the last tinges of selfishness. <laughs> The lack of faith. Faith will be perfect now because now they have nothing to depend upon except Jesus. In that time of trouble, just before Jesus comes, the earthiness is taken away from them. Erased. They stand without fault before the throne of God as Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Their faith is stronger at this point than death itself. They would rather die than sin or dishonor to God. This and nothing short of this is the Advent message. Such a work is going on in the most holy place in heaven. And soon, none know how soon, it'll come to the living generation. 
sin is to be blotted out forever. And the sins of the people of God will be placed on the head of a scapegoat who is led out into the wilderness. Actually, it will be led out into the wilderness for a millennium in a bottomless pit called this earth that has been destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The worshipers will be purged, being no, no more conscious of sin. Let's look at some texts from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2. It says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Let's drop down to chapter back, I should say to the left here, chapter 9, verses 7 to 9. It says, But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure of the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the, through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. There's something going to happen in the judgment of the living generation that will make them ready to see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven. Moses was up on the mountain and he looked at the backside of God. When he comes down off the mountain, the people couldn't stand to even see his face, right? What will it be like when there's 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of angels along with the throne and Jesus coming in clouds of heaven? What will it be like then? This is the finishing of the mystery of God. The seal in the forehead, the development of the first fruits. Jeremiah 50, verse 20. I don't have too long yet. Jeremiah 50, verse 20. I tried to shorten this sermon just a little bit. Believe it or not. Jeremiah 50, verse 20. Here's what it says. I'm looking forward to this day. If you believe it, say amen. amen. In those days and in that time, says the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. What an idea. In the last remnant of time, preparing a people to see God in his glory. The Bible says, behold, he comes in the clouds, and what? Every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. Some of them will be scurrying for the rocks and mountains to fall upon them. But there will be a people who will be looking up in the sky and they'll say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. What made the difference? Do you think any of us this morning be ready for that? I want to read to you from Patriarchs and Prophets 358. In the final atonement, the sins of the truly penitent are blotted out from the records of heaven, no more to be remembered or come into mind. Another one, Great Controversy 620. Their sins have gone beforehand into judgment and have been blotted out, and they cannot bring them to remembrance. Only when this, that's the close quote now, close, end of that quotation. Only when this happens will the people of God be ready to have a face-to-face -face meeting with their God and their creator God and their redeemer. This is the blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We've been talking about this for a lot of years, haven't we? But there's a preparation for this. You'll remember that when John was in his mortal state, he beheld the glory of God and he fell down as one dead. Not able to behold the sight. I want to read from 5T6467. All their sins are blotted out. All their transgressions are borne away. The scapegoat here, right? All their transgressions are borne away. Now they can look upon the undimmed glory of the throne of God. That's what it'll be like when Jesus comes. 
undimmed glory of the, of, of the throne of God. And when Jesus comes, the unforgiven ones, I like what the, what the uh, evangelist said when he had these meetings here recently. He said at the end of the world, there are only two, two, two groups, one group who are forgiven and the other ones are the unforgiven ones. When Jesus comes, the unforgiving given ones will call on the rocks and mountains to fall upon them and hide them from the face of him that sits on the throne. At that same time, Isaiah 25 says, the people of God will look into heavens and they'll welcome him as he sits on the throne with all the glory of heaven in the sky. Such are the prospects and hope of all those who love his appearing. It is to that day that we now approach. We've, what we've talked about today is not the work of the daily. It's not the work of the daily. The daily sanctuary service was for the forgiveness of sin, right? But we're not talking about the daily here. What are we talking about? The yearly. When the priest goes into the most holy place for his people, and as the living generation of earth is matured, what a, what, a, what a day that will be. Perfection is not possible in the normal conversion process. We've all experienced that, haven't we? This is the work of our sin going beforehand into judgment. Peter describes this work in Acts 2.38, where he talks about the remission of sins or the forgiveness of sins. The work of the Holy Spirit in the daily is to bring conviction of sin to sin and repentance and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. That's the work of the daily. We have that every day, right? We have access to Jesus with our sin problem every day. You can call on him at midnight or in the middle of the day. Doesn't matter. He's always there. But the yearly, the Day of Atonement, is reserved, designed to finally bring the seed to maturity for the harvest. That's Acts 3.19. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, that you may be clean from what? All your sins before the Lord. That's Acts 3.19 we read a while ago. Latter rain here. Revelation 14.14 14 and 15. The harvest is the second coming. Let's look at it. Revelation 14, verses 14 and 15. Revelation 14, 14 and 15. And I looked and behold a white cloud. Upon the cloud one sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. My appeal this morning is, let us allow the former rain. Do we have the former rain now? Was the former rain powerful on the day of Pentecost? Is it powerful now? <laughs> yes, if we will give ourselves to Jesus every day, he gives us the Holy Spirit, right? Make that your first work. When you get up in the morning, give your heart to the Lord. Make that your first work and pray for the Holy Spirit, the former reign of the Spirit to come. The Bible says that the former reign and latter reign at last will come in the same month. They'll come pretty close together for all those who are allowing the former reign to do, their work, do, his, do his work. Let us allow the former reign to do his work in the now, so that when the latter rain falls, the seed of hard the seed, the seed of the harvest will mature, and God's final warning to the world will swell into a loud cry. We're looking forward to that day. One day, the glory of the Lord is going to go from one end of the earth to the other, and it'll be ca carried by human messengers. It'll be carried by angels. It all the resources of heaven, and when the earth is lightened with His glory, and what is the lightening of His glory? His character will be the final warning message to the world. And that's what we're looking forward to, heralding the Advent. Our loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you for the great provisions you've made for our salvation, the great cost that it has been. And we just pray, Lord, that we may value that as we go into this new and uncertain week, 
May our anchor be in Jesus, I pray. I pray that you'll be with each one here according to our several needs. Make us ready for your coming, Lord. Make us ready for the judgment that is soon to come for all of us. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.